On the 5th of January 1942, as exultant shouts of victory resounded in the streets of Tokyo, Admiral Loroku Yamamoto instructed the staff of the Imperial Combined Fleet to begin preparing for the second stage of operations in the Pacific War, his study of the situation reports on the Philippines' Malaya, and points south indicated that Japanese troops in a few months would be in control of East Asia and the other areas they had attacked in December. So Yamamoto told his chief of staff, Matome Ugaki, that he wanted the plans to be completed by the middle of February. The speed with which the Japanese had conquered the Western Pacific astounded the planners in Tokyo and brought about sharp disagreement within the Imperial General Staff. The ardent military nationalists wanted to press on, as long as Japan was victorious. No matter how far afield such planning LED, another group represented by Admiral Yamamoto, had been less than enthusiastic about the opening of war with the United States and Britain, and worried about the future. One reason Yamamoto was at sea aboard the combined fleet flagship Yamato was that friends on the Imperial General Staff had worried that if he remained in Tokyo, he would be assassinated because of his public opposition to unlimited war. Even now his opinions were no secret from those around him, his Chief of Staff Admiral Yugaki wrote in his diary about the need for far-sighted statesmanship following this first month of glorious Vict victory. Those were words that Yamamoto often used in warning that Japan could not war on the Western powers, and hoped to win in the long run, Yamamoto's open criticism of the politicians was aimed at Prince Kuno and others, who did not seem to know what sort of war Japan should wage in the Pacific three months before Pearl Harbor Yamamoto had met with a friend, Ryoichi Sasakawa, president of the ultra-nationalist Kokusu Do organization at the Imperial Navy Club in Shiba. Yamamoto, warning his friend that war was inevitable because of decisions taken by the politicians, said that at first we'll have everything our own way, stretching out like an octopus spreading its tentacles. And now, just a month after the war had begun, the octopus was spread almost flat. Yamamoto, however, had also warned his old friend that the euphoria could not last. The time, he said, for political action was the moment that Singapore fell, that disaster would unsettle the BR British in India, and they would undoubtedly be willing to listen to talk of peace. Yamamoto knew the British well. He had been a member of the delegations to the London Naval Conferences of 1930 and 1934. He also knew the Americans, and he had been Japanese naval attaché in Washington from 1926 to 198. He agreed that once war was started by the politicians, a major victory must be won quickly, but when that victory was achieved, he believed Japan would have only a year and a half to bask in glory. We must get a peace agreement. By then he told Sasakawa, and he looked to this old friend to carry the word among the right-wing political leaders who were in power on January 5th. The victory seemed close at hand. The American battleship fleet had been put out of action at Pearl Harbor on December 7th. The British battleships Repulse and Prince of Wales had been sunk off the Malay coast in the Philippines. Manila and the United States naval base at Cavay had been captured, the British had surrendered at Hong Kong, and Japanese forces were on their way to new landings in the Dutch East Indies at Rabaul on New Island Amber, and in the Solomon Islands, the attack at Pearl Harbor, however, had not accomplished all Yamamoto had hoped for the destruction of the major elements of the United States fleet. The aircraft carriers which had been at sea were unharmed and represented a constant threat. What was needed was a spectacular achievement, and Yamamoto did not expect the fall of Singapore for five or six months. It came on February 15th. He believed that if he was to achieve his goal of setting up the stage for negotiation, he must move in another direction. But the question before his planners was where to strike next. The army vetoed Yamamoto's suggestion for an attack on the Soviet Union. Such a war would be fought almost entirely on land, and the army was heavily occupied in China and Southeast Asia. So three other ideas were offered. Yamamoto's favourite was to attack in the Indian Ocean. Invade Salon draw out the British Far Eastern fleet and destroy it, as Yamamoto had destroyed the American ships at Pearl Harbour, and then push into the Middle East to link up with the Germans who were driving toward the Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus. Thus the Japanese navy would be assured of all the oil it needed, 
the army refused to consider a Middle Eastern operation, so only two plans were left. One advocated by the Naval General Staff in Tokyo called for an attack on Australia to deprive the Americans of that forward base of operations. After moving into the Solomon Islands, the Navy would take New Guinea. New Caledonia, Fiji and Samoa advocates of this plan at Imperial General Headquarters were already setting up occupation systems for Australia and New Zealand, but Yamamoto did not like the Australia plan because he thought it would take too long and still would not be spectacular enough to halt the Americans. Yamamoto also knew the Pearl Harbor attack had aroused the spirit of vengeance in people the Japanese had been learning to detest as soft and incompetent. Too soft, the army said to fight a war to the finish. It was apparent that even the capture of Singapore would not stop the Americans. Yamamoto wanted a victory that would make it possible for Japan to extend a generous olive branch. In January, Yamamoto ordered another plan drawn, and two months later S sent officers to Tokyo with the document designated the MI Plan, which envisaged a battle off Midway Island where the American carrier force would be destroyed. He also sent to Tokyo the AL plan, which detailed the invasion of the North American continent via Alaska. If all went well, Hawaii would be occupied, and later perhaps the West Coast. At least victories at Midway and in the Yushans would give the politicians a base for negotiating the sort of peace that Yamamoto hoped to achieve in Tokyo. The admirals quarrelled around the conference table in the Navy Ministry, but in the end, Yamamoto had his way forgotten was the potential significance of the fall of Singapore in February and the impending collapse of Bataan and Corgador, either of which might have served Yamamoto's purpose. The reason they were no longer important lay in the April raid of Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle's B-25 bomber squadron on Tokyo. The Doit raid had shocked the Japanese into a realisation that the Americans were only beginning to fight in June after the Midway operation flamed into disaster for Japan. There was no time for recrimination. Indeed, the army did not even know he full extent of the defeat the news of the destruction of four big fleet carriers was carefully suppressed, so that it was known only at the highest levels of the navy. While Yamamoto had been off on his Midway excursion, the naval general staff in Tokyo had moved the navy and its air forces steadily southward to set up the forthcoming attempt to cut off Australia. Naval forces had taken Rabaul on January 23rd, and from that time onward they had conducted constant air reconnaissance and bombing raids against other islands and New Guinea. It was apparent to the Australians who communicated their concerns to General Douglas MacArthur after his arrival in March that the Japanese would soon move against New Guinea. If they were successful, it would be very nearly a walkover for the Japanese to take northern Australia. In February, the Japanese had already bombed Darwin, and in March, when they invaded Salamaua, New Guinea, the pace stepped up in May. Just before the Midway battle, the Japanese sent an occupation force toward Port Morby, but it was turned back by the fierce defence of the Americans and Australians in the carrier battle. Of the Coral Sea, the Japanese did occupy Tulagi, north of Guadcanal, and built a seaplane base there. The Battle of the Coral Sea convinced plane in Washington and Australia that they had to prepare for a Japanese move in the south. MacArthur told the Australian government it must be ready for an attack before a Japanese thrust that was generally expected to be made against India. He cabled General Marshall for two carriers and a thousand planes, but in Washington that May... Admiral Ernest J. King, Chief of Naval Operations, informed General Marshall that until the end of June he would have only two working carriers in the entire Pacific, while on the eve of Midway the Japanese had ten, and Pacific Fleet Commander Chester W. Nimitz had already given advanced warning about the big move he expected the Japanese to make, which turned out to be the Midway battle, while events were taking their course, at Midway the Japanese were establishing their forces in the New Guinea. Solomon's area, Major General Tamaro Hori landed the South Seas force at Salawa, and the naval troops occupied Ley and began to build up an air base there in independently of Admiral Yamamoto. The Imperial General Staff had planned the Port Morby operation, and Lieutenant General Harukichi Hotake was ordered to press on toward New Caledonia, Fiji and Samoa, and to be ready to resume the advance against Port Morby by July, that would be after the Midway battle, when Admiral Yamamoto could be expected to have returned with his combined fleet 
That big carrier force was expected to protect this new move in spite of the defeat at Midway, which was reported as a victory to the forces in the field. Imperial General Headquarters did not alter its plans a few days after Midway, the Australians informed General MacArthur that the Japanese were ready to move in view of the Midway victory. MacArthur suggested that the Allies make a preemptive attack on the New Britain New Ireland area, and then an assault on Rabel, the main Japanese naval and airbase in the area with the two carriers and the 1,000 planes and an amphibious division, MacArthur would force the Japanese back back to True on June 12th. General Marshall offered the MacArthur plan to Admiral King with some modification. He wanted three carriers instead of two, and one marine division and three army divisions to make the assaults. Admiral King opposed the idea because it would put MacArthur in command of the fighting. King's other reasons were supplementary. The carriers would be subject to land-based attack, and they would not have enough protection. As it turned out, the Navy had to cope with both of these tactical problems at Guadcanal. King devised his own plan, a drive from the new herds by forces under Navy command. MacArthur objected to having his army forces serve under the Navy, but nobody could deny the necessity of stopping the Japanese before they took New Guinea and were poised to attack Australia. The problem for the Joint Chiefs of Staff was who was going to command the operation. They gave Phase 1, the primary task of taking the Santa Cruz Islands to Lagi and adjacent positions to Admiral King Guadcanal was just a spot on the map with no known tactical or strategic value. It did not even merit a name in this JCS plan. General MacArthur was thrown a ESOP after Phase 1. He was to take over and mop up the Japanese in the rest of the Solomons, Raybal and New Guinea. Admiral King was given his way because the Joint Chiefs of Staff recognised that King had already planned a defence line down the Pacific to protect Australia, and his plan would need relatively less force than MacArthur's thousands of troops were training in New Caledonia, and King had weeded General Arnold into sending several squadrons of United States Army Air Force planes there he had reinforced Samoa and Epate in the new Herdies, and he planned to put a base in Tonga Admiral Wilson Brown, whose indecisiveness at the time of the Wake Island crisis had aroused King's annoyance, was shipped off to a newly established. The Guad Canal invasion plan was notable for failures of intelligence. All concerned commands knew that an operation was in the offing, particularly after July 10th when Admiral Nimitz sent Admiral Gormley his operations orders. The major Japanese airbase was located at Rabal Plains from those fields could stop at Guadalcanal refuel, and then bomb Australia. There was no doubt that they could strike a deadly blow at the Allied build-up. But on July 10th, the Allied Intelligence Services report reaching King contained only a casual comment about airfield construction at Guadcanal, and a few days later a report located the field on the wrong side of the island. By the end of July, the Japanese had completed the airfield and back at Combined Fleet Headquarters in Japan. Admiral Yamamoto gave orders that the first staged mission would leave Rabul on August 14th. As commander of the overall United States operation, Admiral Gawley tried desperately to get more help to build advanced bases to bring in more planes. But everywhere he turned, he learned the truth of Admiral King's assertion that he would not be able to provide Gurmley with proper tools. The supplies of the invasion forces, for example, were loaded, hodgepodge aboard the transports at Oakland. There were plenty of docks so that the ships could have been unloaded and reloaded with supplies in the order of their intended use. Instead the ships were sent to Numa, which had had no such facilities, and Admiral King had at least a general idea of the difficulties, but there was not time for delay. King knew better than any of his subordinates the absolute necessity of stopping the Japanese before they got to Australia. The timetable remained, by late July the rush was on, and 177,000 Marines were moving by troopship from California, Pearl Harbor. Numa and Samoa Admiral Gormley was too busy to hold a conference of his commanders. But on July 28th, Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher, who was supposed to be in tactical command, called a meeting aboard his flagship, the carrier Saratoga. For the first time, the tactical unit commanders met to talk about the invasion, and Admiral Fletcher was to protect the invasion with his task force. Admiral Turner was to deliver the troops of Marine General Alexander Vander. Once the Marines had taken the island, garrison troops would be brought in, 
but so hastily was this operation called that no one had made provision for any troops to be held in reserve, there were no more men available in the South Pacific. The meeting on the Saratoga was not a happy one. Fletcher began by announcing that he would protect the landings at Guadcanal for only two days, he insisted, and Gourley's staff members at the meeting concurred that the carriers must not be risked. Fletcher was gun-shy 31, that the whole operation was cockeyed hasty and doomed Admiral Turner, who had a better idea of the global military picture than any other man in the cabin that day, chided his superior. There was no point in that sort of argument, he said, and the decision had been made to risk all it was their job to carry out orders Fletcher ought to have known all that, after Coral Sea Admiral King had been so displeased with Fletcher's constant avoidance of action, that he had insisted Admiral Nimitz ascertain the condition of Fletcher's fighting spirit. Nimitz was a kindly man, and he liked Fletcher. He had given the carrier commander a pep talk, and then, when the Battle of Midway was won, Fletcher, who was in command, there could hardly be faulted, but on the eve of the first American offensive operation to warn the troops and the men of the support ships that he was going to desert them in 48 hours, was a most inauspicious beginning. The rehearsal for the Guadcanal invasion was staged on July 28th and lasted three days. The scene was Kororo Island near Fiji. Only a third of the assigned troops managed to get ashore, and when they did, they didn't know what to do. General Vandergrift regarded the mock-up as a complete bust, but there was no time even to second-guess on July 31st. The Marines were. Back aboard the transports heading for Guadcanal on the afternoon of August 6th as the task force of 75 ships neared the Solomons. Admiral Fletcher nervously broke away with his carriers. He would have his planes over the landing force as promised, but the 26 ships of the carrier group were being taken as far from harm's way as possible if American intelligence was so faulty as to permit the Japanese build-up of the airfield at Guadalcanal. Japanese intelligence was faultier, for as the United States invasion fleet massed in the South Pacific, the Japanese had no inkling of a forthcoming attack in July 1942. The Japanese army was preoccupied with trying to capture New Guinea as a staging point for its operations against Australia and New Zealand. Major General Tamaro H's South Seas Force landed 2,000 troops near Buona. After capturing Buona, the Japanese planned to construct airfields there as a prelude to a new attack on Port Morby. So in July, Japanese air power was concentrated against Port Morby bombers, and fighters swept over the piers and airfields nearly every day. After the Japanese landings, the Japanese AI forces were also called on to support the beachhead, and in the early days of August, their attention was fixed on the new drive. The combined Australian and American Air Force responded with raids on the Japanese airbases at Ley. During these preparations, Admiral Yamamoto's flagship Yamato was anchored at Hashima in Japanese waters, in a leisurely fashion he was preparing for the forthcoming air operations over Australia, and he would see then what action was to be taken next. In preparation on August 3rd, the naval air groups stationed at La were brought back to Rabaul to be ready for the Guadalcanal operations that would begin the following week during the first week of August. The South Pacific skies were cloudy and only a handful of Japanese search planes took to the skies. None of them found the American armada that was steaming toward Guadalcanal. The Japanese airmen flying out of Rabaul were surprised to encounter American carrier aircraft in the skies around Bua. They had been told that the United States carriers were destroyed at Midway. The pilots assumed that the carriers were operating with Australian forces that had marched across the Owen Stanley Mountains. Actually, they were training for the Guadcanal invasion. No one in the Imperial High Command or in the field suspected a forthcoming invasion after their eight months of continuous victories. It was hard for the Japanese to believe that the Allies could launch a seaborne invasion had the idea been suggested. They would would have agreed with General MacArthur and Admiral Gourley that such an invasion had almost no chance of success. So as the American Expeditionary Force moved toward Guadcanal, it enjoyed the element of surprise on August 4th and five, the 75 ships steamed on under an overcast sky, and on August 6th the fleet moved through rain squalls almost all day long. But as dawn rose on the morning of August 7th, the sky cleared, which meant the carrier planes would have good visibility for their attacks. 
Though the fleet went to general quarters at 5.30 and at 6 o'clock, the carriers launched their first strike. The planes from the Wasp, Saratoga and Enterprise were assigned targets on Guadalcanal Island. T. Lagi Gavutu and Tano. The Japanese had established a SE plane base on Gavutu and Tanmogo, which were connected by a causeway the Japanese planes had been kept down the day before by bad weather. Admiral Fletcher's task force reported one unidentified aircraft during the, the day, but whether it was Japanese or a plane from General MacArthur's command was undetermined. In any event, the Japanese were not aroused until 6.12 a.m., when the communications headquarters at the Tagi SE plane base sent a frantic message announcing the attack. The radio message went to the 4th, 6th and 8th fleets, Admiral Yamamoto and Imperial headquarters. It was simple and succinct enemy heavy bombardment in progress. The weather had cleared and the car planes flew off into scattered cumulus clouds in the light of a quarter moon. The fighters and bombers moved off on their appointed missions. Eight fighters led by Lieutenant L. H. Bauer took off from the Enterprise to attack Guadcanal's aircraft PT boats troop installations and supply dumps they found no aircraft and no PT boats and they did strafe the buildings on the airfield at Longer Point. Meanwhile, another eight fighters from the Enterprise maintained a combat air patrol over the transport sports from six until eight o'clock. When they were replaced by others, bombers began to hit Tagi and the Liar Point area, but no enemy air activity was seen all morning. The Americans had it all to themselves, and the only planes damaged were those hurt in operational accidents, Planes from the other carriers struck the seaplane base at Gavutu. The surprise was complete. The American planes arrived and began bombing and strafing the seaplanes in the water. They destroyed nine float planes similar to the 014 engine Kawanishi flying boat and eight seaplanes that doubled as search planes and bombers. A few Japanese pilots who tried to take off were shot down before they were airborne. Not a single Japanese plane at Gavutu survived the attack. Other carrier planes hit Japanese troop concentrations on Tulagi. Some struck targets on the beaches that the Marines would soon invade before dawn. The Marines on the decks of the transports could see the high mountains of the island that was their objective. The transport slipped through the narrow neck that runs between Guadcanal and Savu Islands into Siok Channel as dawn rose. The guns of the escorting warships fired and flashes of light illuminated the fleet. There was virtually no answering fire. The bombardment from the cruisers and destroyers accompanying the troop ships started fires along the shore. An oil dump exploded, sending flames leaping into the sky at eight o'clock. After two hours of bombing and shelling of the island, the landing craft began to move toward the north shore east of Longer Point. The Marines were nervous. Neither they nor then officers had any practical experience in such a landing for this was the first American amphibious invasion since the Spanish-American War. At nine o'clock troops were landing on Guadalcanal. They met no resistance because the Japanese had fled into the hills. The going was ridiculously easy. The Marines soon saw how completely they had surprised the enemy. They came AC Ross wooden barracks that had never been slept in. They found a tent with a breakfast table full of platters and bowls of meat rice and cooked plums, there were half-filled rice bowls scattered around chopsticks hastily dropped on the table or on the straw mats of the floor. The tents themselves told why the Japanese had left so rapidly. They were torn by shrapnel, and some were knocked flat by the shelling of the naval vessels before the landing. But any marine who felt like celebrating over the ease with which they had taken their early objectives had some shocks coming. It was true that the Japanese had been surprised on Guad Canal, and they had not dug in yet nor created permanent fortifications, because most of the men were construction troops, not fighting men, but over on Targi Lieutenant Colonel Merritt Edson's 1st Marine Raider Battalion, and the 5th Battalion of the 2nd Marines had encountered stout resistance. About 250 Japanese were located on this island. The Japanese were troops of the Yokohama Air Base Detachment, under Captain Hasik Miyazaki. They were experienced and dedicated. Fighters Edson's first raiders were the toughest American troops in the Pacific. They were all volunteers chosen from the ranks of a force known for its fighting qualities. The raider concept had come from Lieutenant Colonel Evans Carlson's recommendation for creation of a commando force, 
and Carlson's experience had included a service tour of several months with the Chinese Communist Eighth Route Army in its Gila struggles against the Japanese in North China Edsons. Raiders had trained for many months under Spartan conditions, and when they came to Guad Canal they already had a powerful reputation, as it turned out they would need every trick they had learned and would learn some new ones. This invasion was the first contact between highly trained American troops and seasoned Japanese veterans. Since the war had begun in December, the Japanese had a reputation even more fearsome than that of the raider battalions gained through the phenomenally rapid march of their forces through the Philippines, Malaya and the East Indies. For months, Tokyo had crowed over its victories, and half the world had come to believe the Japanese were invincible, a reputation the Imperial High Command was pleased to encourage Tulagi, then was in a sense the first testing ground Edson's troops landed at 8.15am on the northwestern part of the island, and at the beginning the going did not seem much harder than it was on Guad Canal. They encountered some resistance from a few outposts. The northwest part of Targi was covered with thick jungle small trees, vines and bougainvillea, with its beautiful leaves and sharp thorns. At first the terrain seemed to be the worst obstacle. Edson lost only one man, and that one to a sniper, as the marines hit the beach. Edson planned to move inland to a ridge that ran the length of the island, and then work along the top of that ridge, clearing the slopes as they moved south. But the terrain was so difficult that it took three hours for the men to chop their way along a mile and a half of rising ground, having reached the ridge line. The marines moved ahead, came out of the jungle and ran straight into the central Japanese defences built on the hillside. The Japanese had constructed dugouts and rock embrasures and had placed their machine guns carefully to create interlocking fields of fire. The Japanese defence was based on keeping the enemy below them, but the marine found that by crawling up the cliffs they could drop charges of dynamite and grenades into the dugouts, and that was the method they had to use to advance once a dugout was blown, it still was not safe in one hole. The Americans killed 17 Japanese with dynamite charges. One Marine spotted a radio inside and went in to retrieve it. There were still two Japanese soldiers alive, and they shot him, and another man who came after him before they were killed. One section of Marines took on this defence position in the centre of the island, while the centre and left flank of Edson's force pushed down the ridge, but even along the ridge line, the going was not easy. One company suffered 15% casualties. That first afternoon, the frontal resistance was stiff, but with the Japanese frontal resistance was only half the battle snipers seemed to be everywhere, tied in trees in the tops of buildings behind rocks. A favourite tactic of the snipers was to let the forward element of a marine unit pass and then begin shooting at the men from behind this move almost always meant death for the sniper, but usually not before he had caused several casualties, and one thing the first raiders learned that day was that the small 25 caliber Japanese rifle and machine gun slug were more apt to wound than to kill, which, from the Japanese point of view, was satisfactory, since it took additional troops and resources to care for the wounded during the afternoon. The raiders drove along the ridge, and until they ran into a three-sided ravine, whose floor was an old British cricket field the Japanese had dug into the ravine walls and established the fields of fire that would become so familiar in later months. As the Marines moved up, they ran into crossfire and Edson stopped because darkness was coming, and this was no time to be probing. You known dangers, that night the Marines on Tulagi had another new experience. The Japanese, knowing they were outnumbered with no chance of survival, staged one of the death-desperate counter-attacks for which they would become infamous. They waited until the marine perimeter was quiet, then at 10.30am, they broke through between two companies and surrounded one of them. The marines fought in their foxholes and in the open using guns, machine guns, grenades and knives. The Japanese came along the ridge toward Colonel Edson's command post and reached a point 50 yards from him. Finally, the Marines overpowered the Japanese and threw them back, but not before one company had lost half its non-commissioned officers. The next day, August 8th, more troops were landed on Tulagi until there were 7,500 on that side of Sea Channel Edson's raiders, and men of the 5th Battalion of the 2nd Marines began moving again toward the southeastern end of the island.
One by one, they attacked the Dugin machine gun positions on the steep sides of the old cricket ground. From one cave, they removed 35 dead Japanese, some of them already rotting and stinking, but some killed in the last moment of defence of the position. From this, the Americans deduced properly that the Japanese tactic was to hold a position until the last, unless ordered to retreat, proof of the discipline of the Japanese armed forces. Those troops who surrendered on Guadcanal were mostly members of labour battalions, not combat troops. The raiders that second day encountered dozens of examples of a spirit they had not seen before. In one dugout, they cornered three Japanese officers, who at the end had only one loaded pistol among them, as the marines were ready to make the final assault. They heard three shots when they entered the dugout. They discovered three bodies and an empty pistol. One officer had fired all but his last three rounds, then shot his two companions and himself. In those first days, this suicidal attitude surprised the marines. It was hard for an American to understand how cornered or wounded men, with no hope of survival in their hole, knowing that the enemy had an end material, a numerical advantage would almost invariably choose death to surrender it, took some getting used to. But after a few Japanese had pretended to surrender only to pull out guns or bayonets to attack their captors, or to explode grenades to kill themselves and their enemies, the Marines took the Japanese on their own terms, Thereafter, there was virtually no further attempt to persuade Japanese soldiers to surrender to Lagi was brought under control on that second day, although not all the Japanese on the island had been killed for days. Afterward, Japanese snipers harassed the American troops until the last sniper was killed. One gets a feel for the stubbornness of the fighting on Tulagi in the experience of Gunnery Sergeant Angus Goss. He had gone ahead of his men to attack a cave near the cricket field the Japanese had fired sporadically from that position. He moved up close enough to throw hand grenades into the cave, and the Marines had been trained to pull the ring pin of the egg-shaped grenade throw count slowly and hear the explosion. Sergeant Goss pulled the pin through and counted on six. The grenade was lobbed back out of the cave, and he had to duck to escape the blast of his own weapon after another identical experience. He held the grenade for three seconds, then threw four, five, six, and out it came. Again, Sergeant Goss called for a satchel charge, a bag filled with dynamite usually used to blow buildings. He thrust in the charge charge, primed it and ran back a little. The Japanese thrust the charge out of the mouth of the cave. The dynamite exploded and drove a rock splinter into Goss's leg. The wound was not serious enough to F.A. him, but it hurt enough to infuriate him. He picked up his submachine gun and dashed into the cave, spraying fire. He killed four Japanese soldiers and counted eight others who had died earlier. If possible, the fighting on Gavutu and Tano was worse than that on Tulagi. The landings there came in the middle of the morning. Not many troops were committed because no one expected to find many Japanese there. But since the seaplane base was on these islands, the Japanese had fortified them and the Marines ran into trouble. The Japanese were surprised and had still not recovered from the bombardment and aerial attack that had destroyed their seaplanes, so the first troops ashore were met by rifle fire only. But when the second wave of marines reached the beach, the Japanese had organised about 500 yards back, and the fire was intense. The third wave came under fire before the landing craft reached shore, and the casualties were heavy Gavutu, and Tan Mogo were both dominated by small hills not quite 150 feet high, but above the sea-level landings, this height was enough. The Japanese had built their defences along the slopes, and they were well supplied with machine guns, automatic rifles and ammunition, as on Tulagi, each Japanese position had to be taken, they did not retreat, and the viciousness of the fighting on Tanamogo was almost unbelievable, in the early waves the marines had landed tanks. The Japanese had come surging toward the Tanu dock where the landings had been made. They had jammed crowbars under the treads, thrown grenades, and tried to set the tanks afire with rags soaked in gasoline. One tank commander had opened the hatch and employed the tank's machine gun to kill 23 Japanese soldiers before one scram bled up the side of the tank and stabbed him to death with a bayonet. Another Japanese then threw gasoline-soaked rags inside the tank and it burned by mid-afternoon on this first day. It was apparent that the Marines could use reinforcements, 
and a unit that had landed earlier on Florida Island, where there were no Japanese, was called over to assist. Tanamogo had been taken, but the Marines were unable to secure the corway that linked the two small islands. The reinforcements were ordered to Tan Amogo, and at dusk were given five minutes of preparatory bombardment from naval vessels. Unluckily, one of the last shells hit a fuel dump near the beach and lit up the shore as if it were noon. As the Marines came up, the Japanese had them clearly silhouetted against the sea from the dugouts on the hills came a steady stream of machine gun and rifle fire. Two boatloads of Marines reached the beach, but the coxswain of the third boat was killed at his tiller, and the boat slewed around and headed back out to sea. The following boats did the same, believing there had been some change in orders, so the men of the two boats were stranded ashore, and their only protection was the concrete pier the Japanese were firing. As soon as the Americans returned the fire, the Japanese spotted the position by the tracers. Soon several men were down, one boat retired, taking the wounded, and it was some time before the confusion was eliminated and other boats began to land. Meanwhile, the Japanese launched a counter-attack on the beach. Captain Crane, the leader of the unit, was cut off from his boat, and he and five men hid in the brush, and in the darkness they escaped to return to the beach after the Japanese had drawn back to their hillside positions. Eventually they were extricated, but it was four o'clock on the morning of August 8th before another unit landed and was able to secure the causeway. When the fighting started, there were 500 Japanese on the connecting isets of Gutu and Tanamogo. When the fighting ended, there were none early on the morning of August 7th, the Tulagi radio station flashed the first word of the United States assault to Rabul. The astounding news reached the Rabau airfield, just as the pilots of the early morning missions were preparing to take off for another day's harassment of the Australians on New Guinea. The orders were immediately cancelled, and all available planes were dispatched to strike the American invasion force before the planes could take off, they received the unwelcome news from Tulagi. The entire flying boat flotilla had been destroyed, then contact with Tulagi was broken, which could only mean that the base there had been overrun at 8.30am. A flight of 27 twin-engine Betty bombers took off from Rabul. They had been loaded for the strike against Australian forces on New Guinea, so they carried bombs instead of torpedoes. 180 fighters accompanied them as they climbed to 13,000 feet, flew east to Bua Island, and turned south of along the Banville coast they were picked up by four Enterprise planes just after one o'clock in the afternoon. The Enterprise fighters were flying at 18,000 feet, when down below they spotted the large formation of Betty bombers, escorted by the Zeros just above Florida Island. The F-4FS attacked, and Lieutenant VP Deus shot down one bomber. Four others began to smoke, and were listed as probables. But after this initial run, the Zeros joined the fight, and the F-4Fs broke off to take refuge in cloud cover, as they had been instructed to do. They had been hard hit, one of the F-4Fs had been shot down, and Lieutenant D's plane was so badly shot up, he had to make an emergency landing on the WASP Lieutenant GE Firebar LED, another flight of six fighters from the Enterprise, and they found the enemy off Santa Isabel Island. The Zeros came in fast ten of them and attacked three of the fighters. All three F-4Fs were shot down. The other three American fighters attacked the bombers, and Enan RN dis shot down one Betty. The first kill of a Zero was made by radio electrician TBW Rhodes, but the Zeros came after them in force, and the F-4Fs ducked into clouds to hide. There were ten Zeros after them in two formations, and they came in observing the Japanese rule, never let your wingman out of sight. They attacked the F-4Fs from the starboard quarter, and Lieutenant Firebar and enlisted pilot W.S. Stevenson Jr. and pilot machinist W.H. Warden were shot down. One of the coast watchers picked up Firebar from the water off Santa Isabel Island. A Guadcanal coast watcher sent a canoe to rescue Warden off that same island, but Stevenson was not found aboard the other carriers. The story was much the same, the bombers were much easier targets. Six fighters of Flight 323 ran into enemy bombers off Longer Point and shot down four of them. Machinist Darunan destroyed two single-handedly just after 2.30 a.m. in the afternoon, when the Japanese Betty bombers and Zero fighters began their run over the islands. Coast watchers were on the alert. 
Paul Edward Mason, a copra planter in peacetime, was stationed on Malab Hill on Banville, overlooking Buin, at nine o'clock in the morning. He sent a message that 24 Japanese bombers were heading toward Guad Canal. They were still 400 M or two and a four hours away from the target. When that message was broadcast back from Pearl Harbor to the fleet, that message reached the invasion fleet in plenty of time for preparations. The reaction of HMAS Canberra, one of the Australian cruisers, was typical. When the word came, the boatswain's mate piped the message, the ship will be attacked at noon by 24 torpedo bombers. All hands will pipe to dinner at 11 o'clock, and the torpedo bombers came in right on schedule. The United States fighters climbed above them to 20,000 feet as the bombers reached the north shore of Guadcanal and looked down on the invasion fleet at noon. The American carrier fighters and the guns of the ships were ready for them. For the first time in the South Pacific, the Japanese were feeling the results of counterattack. The American fighter planes were quite effective against the twin-engine bombers of the 24 Bettys that finally arrived over Guadcanal. All but one was shot down, and the only damage sustained in that first attack was to the destroyer mug Buford, which was hit by a bomb against the Zero fighters. However, it was a different story. Pilot officer Saro Sakai Japan's leading ace was among those 18 chosen for their skill to make this first long-range mission over the target. The Japanese force was jumped by F-4F Wildcats from the carriers, and they went in straight for the bombers, ignoring the Zeros. The Zeros protected the bombers as well as they could, but then turned to the American fighters. Sakai was puzzled by the American tactics the Navy pilots dived against the Zeros, but if they missed on the first pass, they scattered and evaded. They had been instructed well by their intelligence officers, who knew that the Zero was superior in turning and climbing ability, as well as faster. After a grim and skilful battle, Sakai shot down one F-4F and an SBD dive bomber that by itself jumped four Zeros, several other Japanese. Stick close together, and when attacked, each two-plane element should set up a scissors movement constantly turning toward each other. Thus, the pair of F-4Fs could concentrate their superior firepower on the enemy, while they knew their own planes could absorb an enormous amount of punishment on the ground the Marines fought. Fierce Japanese opposition on Tulagi Gavutu and Tanamogo on Tulagi, they suffered 90 casualties, but took control of the island by the end of the second day, the Japanese garrison of 250 men fought to the end. 200 men were killed, three surrendered, and the rest swam the strait to Florida Island to continue fighting on Gavutu and Tanambu. The Marines suffered 250 casualties. The 500-man Japanese garrison was wiped out to the last man. The fierceness of this fighting on Tulagi was in sharp contrast with the easy advance of the Marines on Guadcanal. There on the morning of August 8th, the Marines reached the edge of the airport they would name Henderson Field, after a flyer killed at Midway. They were beginning to develop a contempt for the enemy. I wish those Japanese would come out and fight, one Marine said, within the hearing of Richard Tracis, the international news service correspondent who had accompanied the invasion, all they do is run into the jungle on the surface. Then the Marines couldn't ask for a finer war, but the officers were edgy. That second afternoon, it was too easy at sea. The Americans apparently had no opposition. Either a few Japanese patrol craft and tenders, and one or two transports had been caught off the shore, and they had been destroyed in the first hours of the invasion by shelling and bombing, only in the air were the Japanese giving the Americans pause. Most of those first WES of bombers were destroyed, but the cost of meeting the Zeros was 21 of Admiral Fletcher's 99 carrier planes, that loss not high by operational standards convinced Fletcher that his decision to withdraw was sound at six o'clock that evening. Fletcher asked Admiral Gormley to allow him to withdraw his carriers. He withdrew before he had a reply when Admiral Turner intercepted Fletcher's dispatch. He realised that the carrier withdrawal would leave him without any air cover, though the number of Japanese planes could be expected to increase sharply as the enemy brought down more aircraft through the island chain, as Fletcher began to withdraw, the Japanese were moving in force when the word invasion had been flashed from Guadalcanal to rubble Vice Admiral Gichi Maawa had reacted immediately. Admiral Maawa was commander of the Japanese 8th Fleet, 
and the Outer South Seas Force, which meant he had the responsibility for the whole South Pacific operation, his first move was to load six small transports with troops and dispatch them with destroyer escort to reinforce the 2,000-man Guad Canal garrison. But the convoy ran into the American submarine S-38, which was operating out of Australia following the fall of the Philippines. The S-38 sank the transport Mayo Maru with 342 men aboard the sinking, coupled with the reports of the enormous American invasion flotilla, persuaded the Admiral that it was too dangerous at the moment to try to reinforce the garrison, and he called back the other five transports. By that time, Japanese naval assistance was already on the way to Guadcanal. Admiral Mawa had been lucky in the matter of timing early on the morning of August 7th, as the Tulagi garrison sent its last message. Five heavy cruisers left Cavern on the northern tip of New Ireland. Three of them were headed northeast for Manus Island in the Admiralty Group, and two were bound for Rabul. Admiral Mawa soon ordered all five cruisers to hasten to Rabul shortly after noon. The cruiser Choai, accompanied by a destroyer, moved into Simpson Harbour. The other four cruisers waited in St George's Channel between New Ireland and New Britain for the Choai to rejoin. When she came up late that afternoon, she was carrying Admiral Mawa himself and was accompanied by the light cruisers Tenryu and Yubari, so the Japanese moved toward Guadalcanal with five heavy cruisers. Two light cruisers and a destroyer as they sped South Admiral Mawa composed his battle plan by cutting speed. They could delay their arrival until after midnight on August 8th and make a surprise night attack on the American forces at the beachhead. The Admiral knew that the Americans had several carriers in that area while he had none. A night attack was a guarantee that he would not be harassed by American planes since the Americans had no record of proficiency in night aerial operations. In fact, the Americans had no record of competence in any sort of night naval operations, while this aspect of tactics had become a Japanese specialty. MIA's problem that afternoon was how to move close to Guadcanal without coming in too soon and still not give away the element of surprise he had to attack to support the Guadcanal defenders. But if he could surprise the enemy, the effectiveness would be enormous. The Admiral did not know it just then, but the nature of the divided command, the inferiority of the American air intelligence system, and the lack of clearly defined search methods would all play directly into his hands for intelligence about Japanese ship movements. The Americans at Guadalcanal had to depend on air search and submarine reports only under the most special circumstances. Would the reports of coast watchers be of much use concerning naval ship operations? Early in the day, the cruisers were sighted by United States B-17 Army bombers as they moved down toward Rabaul on the evening of August 7th. The Mawa force was sighted by the S-38 just as it came out of St. George's Channel that night. The commander of the S-38 reported the contact to Brisbane, but those two reports were not given much credence by American naval commanders because Rabaul had become the Japanese Navy's forward base and it was quite normal for ships to move in and out. The Americans saw no indication that the ships in question were steaming toward Guadcanal. Admiral Gawley was responsible for the coordination of all elements of the American attack, but to secure air searches he had to depend on several sources first were the long-range B-17 bombers of General MacArthur's American Army Air Force and the Australian Army Air Force part of MacArthur's command, which operated independently second, was Admiral McCain's land-based naval air force, which included a number of SE plane tenders and PBY patrol bombers. General MacArthur's planes were to take responsibility for the search of the Bismar Islands concentrating on the big naval and air base at Rabal McCain, was to watch the northern approaches to the region which meant True and the Marshal's Admiral Fletcher's carrier planes were supposed to make short-range searches but actually made none at all. Fletcher was bemused with his worries Admiral Turner had looked at his charts and seen that the Japanese had a marvellous approach to the island of Guadalcanal along the west coast of Banville, straight down between Shazal Island and Vilela, past Columbangara between New Georgia and Santa Isabel, and then between Florida Island and Guadcanal's north coast. The lane was christened the slot. Soon it was to become infamous in American naval history on the morning of August 8th.
Four PB were scheduled to fly from Nandi on a 700M long triangular pattern, whose apex was the Fiji Islands. They would come up almost due west of Santa Cruz Island 6PB, would fly search patterns from Espiritu Santo northeast over the Santa Cruz Islands, and end at a point slightly above the Bismarcks, but far to the west of the Japanese task force 6PB would spread out from M across the slot from Guadcanal to search an area north and west of the slot. 3B7S were to search north of Guadcanal on the night of August 7th when Admiral Turner studied the search plan for the following day. He found the slot was completely uncovered. He asked Admiral McCain for a special search there the next day but somehow between Admiral Turner's flagship Admiral McCain's headquarters and the SE plane tender Mackinac at M, the message was lost. The search was never made thus on August 8th. The Americans had left uncovered the most obvious approach of any enemy naval force to Guad Canal on the 5th of January 1942. As exultant shouts of victory resounded in the streets of Tokyo, Admiral Loroku Yamamoto instructed the staff of the Imperial Combined Fleet to begin preparing for the second stage of operations in the Pacific War. His study of the situation reports on the Philippines, Malaya, and points south indicated that Japanese troops in a few months would be in control of East Asia and the other areas they had attacked in December. So Yamamoto told his chief of staff, Matome Ugaki, that he wanted the plans to be completed by the middle of February, the speed with which the Japanese had conquered the Western Pacific astounded the planners in Tokyo and brought about sharp disagreement within the Imperial General Staff. The ardent military nationalists wanted to press on as long as Japan was victorious, no matter how far afield such planning LED, another group represented by Admiral Yamamoto, had been less than enthusiastic about the opening of war with the United States and Britain and worried about the future. One reason Yamamoto was at sea aboard the combined fleet, flagship Yamato, was that friends on the Imperial General Staff had worried that if he remained in Tokyo, he would be assassinated because of his public opposition to unlimited war. Even now, his opinions were no secret from those around him, his chief of staff, Admiral Ugaki, wrote in his diary about the need for far-sighted statesmanship following this first month of glorious Vict victory. Those were words that Yamamoto often used in warning that Japan could not war on the Western powers, and hoped to win. In the long run, Yamamoto's open criticism of the politicians was aimed at Prince Kuno and others who did not seem to know what sort of war Japan should wage in the Pacific. Three months before Pearl Harbor, Yamamoto had met with a friend, Ryoichi Sasakawa, president of the ultra-nationalist Kokusudo organization at the Imperial Navy Club in Shiba Yamamoto, warning his friend that war was inevitable because of decisions taken by the politicians, said that at first we'll have everything our own way stretching out like an octopus, spreading its tentacles. And now, just a month after the war had begun, the octopus was spread almost flat. Yamamoto, however, had also warned his old friend that the euphoria could not last. The time, he said, for political action was the moment that Singapore fell, that disaster would unsettle the BR British in India, and they would undoubtedly be willing to listen to talk of peace. Yamamoto knew the British well. He had been a member of the delegations to the London Naval Conferences of 1930 and 1934. He also knew the Americans, and he had been Japanese naval attaché in Washington, from 1926 to 198. He agreed that once war was started by the politicians, a major victory must be won quickly. But when that victory was achieved, he believed Japan would have only a year and a half to bask in glory. We must get a peace agreement by then. He told Sasakawa, and he looked to this old friend to carry the word among the right-wing political leaders who were in power. On January 5th, the victory seemed close at hand. The American battleship fleet had been put out of action at Pearl Harbor on December 7th. The British battleships Repulse and Prince of Wales had been sunk off the Malay coast in the Philippines. Manila and the United States naval base at Cavay had been captured. The British had surrendered at Hong Kong, and Japanese forces were on their way to new landings in the Dutch East Indies at Rabaul on New Ireland Amber. And in the Solomon Islands, the attack at Pearl Harbor, however, had not accomplished all Yamamoto had hoped for the destruction of the major elements of the United States fleet,
The aircraft carriers which had been at sea were unharmed and represented a constant threat. What was needed was a spectacular achievement, and Yamamoto did not expect the fall of Singapore for five or six months. It came on February 15th, he believed that if he was to achieve his goal of setting up the stage for negotiation, he must move in another direction. But the question before his planners was where to strike next. The army vetoed Yamamoto's suggestion for an attack on the Soviet Union. Such a war would be fought almost entirely on land, and the army was heavily occupied in China and Southeast Asia. So three other ideas were offered Yamamoto's favourite was to attack in the Indian Ocean, invade Salon, draw out the British Far Eastern fleet and destroy it, as Yamamoto had destroyed the American ships at Pearl Harbour, and then push into the Middle East to link up with the Germans who were driving toward the Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus. Thus the Japanese navy would be assured of all the oil it needed. The army refused to consider a Middle Eastern operation, so only two plans were left. One advocated by the naval general staff in Tokyo called for an attack on Australia to deprive the Americans of that forward base of operations. After moving into the Solomon Islands, the Navy would take New Guinea, New Caledonia, Fiji and Samoa advocates of this plan at Imperial General Headquarters were already setting up occupation systems for Australia and New Zealand, but Yamamoto did not like the Australia plan because he thought it would take too long and still would not be spectacular enough to halt the Americans. Yamamoto also knew the Pearl Harbour attack had aroused the spirit of vengeance in people the Japanese had been learning to detest, as soft and incompetent, too soft the army said to fight a war to the finish. It was apparent that even the capture of Singapore would not stop the Americans. Yamamoto wanted a victory that would make it possible for Japan to extend a generous olive branch in January. Yamamoto ordered another plan drawn, and two months later S sent officers to Tokyo with the document designated the MI plan, which envisaged a battle off Midway Island where the American carrier force would be destroyed. He also sent to Tokyo the AL plan, which detailed the invasion of the North American continent via Alaska. If all went well, Hawaii would be occupied and later perhaps the West Coast, at least victories at Midway and in the Yushins would give the politicians a base for negotiating the sort of peace that Yamamoto hoped to achieve in Tokyo. The admirals quarrelled around the conference table in the Navy Ministry, but in the end Yamamoto had his way forgotten was the potential significance of the fall of Singapore in February and the impending collapse of Bataan and Corgador, either of which might have served Yamamoto's purpose, the reason they were no longer important, lay in the April raid of Lieutenant Colonel Jimmy Doolittle's B-25 bomber squadron on Tokyo. The Doit raid had shocked the Japanese into a realisation that the Americans were only beginning to fight in June, after the midway operation flamed into disaster for Japan. There was no time for recrimination. Indeed, the army did not even know he full extent of the defeat. The news of the destruction of four big fleet carriers was carefully suppressed, so that it was known only at the highest levels of the navy. While Yamamoto had been off on his midway excursion, the naval general staff in Tokyo had moved the navy and its air forces steadily southward to set up the forthcoming attempt to cut off Australia. Naval forces had taken Rabaul on January 23rd, and from that time onward they had conducted constant air reconnaissance and bombing raids against other islands and New Guinea. It was apparent to the Australians who communicated their concerns to General Douglas MacArthur after his arrival in March that the Japanese would soon move against New Guinea if they were successful. It would be very nearly a walkover for the Japanese to take northern Australia. In February, the Japanese had already bombed Darwin, and in March, when they invaded Salamawa, New Guinea, the pace stepped up in May, just before the Midway Battle. The Japanese sent an occupation force toward Port Morby but it was turned back by the fierce defence of the Americans and Australians in the carrier battle of the Coral Sea. The Japanese did occupy Tulagi north of Guadcanal and built a seaplane base there. The Battle of the Coral Sea convinced plane in Washington and Australia that they had to prepare for a Japanese move in the south. MacArthur told the Australian government it must be ready for an attack before a Japanese thrust that was generally expected to be made against India. He cabled General Marshall for two carriers and a thousand planes, but in Washington that May, 
Admiral Ernest J. King, Chief of Naval Operations, informed General Marshall that until the end of June he would have only two working carriers in the entire Pacific, while on the eve of Midway the Japanese had ten, and Pacific Fleet Commander Chester W. Nimitz had already given advanced warning about the big move he expected the Japanese to make, which turned out to be the Midway battle, while events were taking their course at Midway, the Japanese were establishing their forces in the New Guinea. Solomon's area Major General Tamaro Hori landed the South Seas force at Salawa, and the naval troops occupied Ley and began to build up an airbase there in independently of Admiral Yamamoto. The Imperial General Staff had planned the Port Morby operation, and Lieutenant General Harukichi Hotake was ordered to press on toward New Caledonia, Fiji and Samoa, and to be ready to resume the advance against Port Morby by July. That would be after the Midway Battle, when Admiral Yamamoto could be expected to have returned with his combined fleet. That big carrier force was expected to protect this new move, in spite of the defeat at Midway, which was reported as a victory to the forces in the field. Imperial General Headquarters did not alter its plans a few days after Midway, the Australians informed General MacArthur that the Japanese were ready to move in view of the Midway victory. MacArthur suggested that the Allies make a preemptive attack on the New Britain New Ireland area, and then an assault on Rabul, the main Japanese naval and air base in the area with the two carriers, and the 1,000 planes and an amphibious division, MacArthur would force the Japanese back back to True on June 12th. General Marshall offered the MacArthur plan to Admiral King with some modification. He wanted three carriers instead of two, and one marine division, and three army divisions to make the assaults. Admiral King opposed the idea, because it would put MacArthur in command of the fighting. King's other reasons were supplementary. The carriers would be subject to land-based attack, and they would not have enough protection. As it turned out, the Navy had to cope with both of these tactical problems at Guadcanal. King devised his own plan, a drive from the new herds by forces under Navy command. MacArthur objected to having his army forces serve under the Navy, but nobody could deny the necessity of stopping the Japanese before they took New Guinea and were poised to attack Australia. The problem for the Joint Chiefs of Staff was who was going to command the operation. They gave Phase 1 the primary task of taking the Santa Cruz Islands to Lagi and adjacent positions to Admiral King Guadcanal was just a spot on the map with no known tactical or strategic value. It did not even merit a name in this JCS plan. General MacArthur was thrown at Iesop after Phase 1. He was to take over and mop up the Japanese in the rest of the Solomons, Rabal and New Guinea. Admiral King was given his way because the Joint Chiefs of Staff recognised that King had already planned a defence line down the Pacific to protect Australia, and his plan would need relatively less force than MacArthur's thousands of troops were training in New Caledonia, and King had weeded General Arnold into sending several squadrons of United States Army Air Force planes there. He had reinforced Samoa and Epete in the new herds, and he planned to put a base in Tonga Admiral Wilson Brown, whose indecisiveness at the time of the Wake Island crisis had aroused King's annoyance, was shipped off to a newly established unit called the Amphibious Training Command at San Diego. He and Marine Major General Holland Smith were told to develop new techniques for island warfare. Rear Admiral Richmond Kelly. Turner King's chief plans officer suggested that the first effort must be to hold the line in the South Pacific, while training the amphibious forces. The second stage would be a combined offensive by the United States, Australia and New Zealand through the Solomon Islands to the Bismarck Archipelago and the Admiralty Islands. The third stage would involve seizure of the Caroline and Marshall Islands and the fourth stage would take the Allies either to the Dutch East Indies or to the Philippines. Admiral King approved this plan. It was just what he himself envisioned and he made arrangements to bring Vice Admiral Robert L. Gawley, who was serving as a naval observer in London, to head the South Pacific Command. King detached Rear Admiral Turner from the Plans Division and told him to get ready to take over as commander of the amphibious operation. All this was done even before the Japanese assault on Port Morby and Tulagi Vice Admiral Gawley left Washington on May 1st. He would take command of the South Pacific Force on June 19th, but first he had to go to Pearl Harbor to report to Admiral Nimitz, 
who would be his direct superior. By the time Gurmley got to Pearl Harbor, the Japanese offensive was already beginning in the South Pacific. On May 22, an army plane saw a Japanese photo-reconnaissance aircraft taking pictures of Guad Canal. Army intelligence suggested that the Japanese were preparing to build an airfield there on June 25th. Army intelligence reported that the grass on the island's central plain had been burned off, and tents had gone up in the area a wharf was under construction at Lunga six days later. An Australian coast watcher on Guad Canal reported that construction of an airfield was only awaiting the arrival of Japanese construction units. He even knew the names the 11th, 8th and 13th Pioneer Forces, which were the equivalent of American CB units. This information was confirmed in a radio interception made by Nimitz's intelligence officers at Pearl Harbor, the Pacific Fleet's radio intelligence group, which had broken parts of the Japanese naval code, picked up a message saying that the 11th and 13th Pioneer Forces would arrive at their destination on July 4th, and fleet intelligence put two and two together. Admiral Turner happened to be visiting Pearl Harbor that day, on his way to prepare for the amphibious landing somewhere in the South Pacific, when Admiral Nimitz received the radio intelligence report, Admiral Turner knew where he was going. It could be no place but the Solomons. Within two weeks, Turner was in Wellington, where he boarded his flagship the USS Macaulay, the former Grace Line passenger ship Santa Barbara. His task was to train a whole amphibious task force in one month as Turner began to move ships and men around. Admiral Gormley was on his way to Melbourne to confer with General MacArthur. Gormley left New Zealand with his head full of gloomy thoughts about the foolishness of trying to stage an amphibious operation when no one knew how to do it. MacArthur, who had his own reasons for disliking the plan, agreed with him entirely. They also agreed that with the planes at hand, they could not guarantee the landing sufficient air coverage after all this meeting occurred on July 18th, and the landings were to be made in three weeks the centre dispatch back to Washington, recommending that the operation be deferred but King was not happy with that message King had told his new commander that he was handing him a difficult job and that he would not be able to give him the proper tools until perhaps the fall the answer was no. The invasion would proceed as planned. Now Gawley had left Washington convinced that the United States was not ready for aggressive action in the South Pacific. His gloom increased when he tried and failed to get CBS and other units sent immediately to New Zealand. From the beginning, the Guad Canal invasion plan was notable for failures of intelligence all. Concerned commands knew that an operation was in the offing, particularly after July 10th, when Admiral Nimitz sent Admiral Gormley his operations orders. The major Japanese airbase was located at Rabaul Plains from those fields could stop at Guadalcanal refuel and then bomb Australia. There was no doubt that they could strike a deadly blow at the Allied build-up but on July 10th, the Allied Intelligence Services report reaching King contained only a casual comment about airfield construction at Guad Canal, and a few days later a report located the field on the wrong side of the island by the end of July. The Japanese had completed the airfield and back at Combined Fleet Headquarters in Japan. Admiral Yamamoto gave orders that the first staged mission would leave Rabul on August 14th as commander of the overall United States operation. Admiral Gawley tried desperately to get more help to build advanced bases to bring in more planes, but everywhere he turned he learned the truth of Admiral King's assertion that he would not be able to provide Gurmley with proper tools. The supplies of the invasion forces, for example, were loaded hodgepodge aboard the transports at Oakland. There were plenty of docks so that the ships could have been unloaded and reloaded with supplies in the order of their intended use, Instead, the ships were sent to Numa, which had had no such facilities, and Admiral King had at least a general idea of the difficulties, but there was not time for delay. King knew better than any of his subordinates the absolute necessity of stopping the Japanese before they got to Australia. The timetable remained by late July, the rush was on, and 177,000 Marines were moving by troopship from California. Pearl Harbor, Numa and Samoa. Admiral Gormley was too busy to hold a conference of his commanders, but on July 28th, Admiral Frank Jack Fletcher, who was supposed to be in tactical command, called a meeting aboard his flagship, the carrier Saratoga, for the first time the tactical unit commanders met to talk about the invasion.
and Admiral Fletcher was to protect the invasion with his task force. Admiral Turner was to deliver the troops of Marine General Alexander Vander once the Marines had taken the island. Garrison troops would be brought in, but so hastily was this operation called that no one had made provision for any troops to be held in reserve. There were no more men available in the South Pacific. The meeting on the Saratoga was not a happy one. Fletcher began by announcing that he would protect the landings at Guadcanal for only two days. He insisted, and Gurley's staff members at the meeting concurred that the carriers must not be risked. Fletcher was gun-shy 31 that the whole operation was cockeyed hasty and doomed Admiral Turner, who had a better idea of the global military picture than any other man in the cabin that day chided his superior. There was no point in that sort of argument, he said and the decision had been made to risk all it was their job to carry out orders. Fletcher ought to have known all that after Coral Sea Admiral King had been so displeased with Fletcher's constant avoidance of action that he had insisted Admiral Nimitz ascertain the condition of Fletcher's fighting spirit. Nimitz was a kindly man, and he liked Fletcher. He had given the carrier commander a pep talk, and then when the Battle of Midway was won, Fletcher, who was in command, there could hardly be faulted but on the eve of the first American offensive operation to warn the troops and the men of the support ships that he was going to desert them in 48 hours was a most inauspicious beginning. The rehearsal for the Guadcanal invasion was staged on July 28th and lasted three days. The scene was Kororo Island near Fiji, only a third of the assigned troops managed to get ashore, and when they did, they didn't know what to do. General Vandergrift regarded the mock-up as a complete bust, but there was no time even to second-guess. On July 31st, the Marines were back aboard the transports heading for Guadcanal on the afternoon of August 6th as the task. Off on their appointed missions, eight fighters, led by Lieutenant L. H. Bauer, took off from the Enterprise to attack Guadcanal's aircraft PT boats troop installations and supply dumps they found no aircraft and no PT boats, and they did strafe the buildings on the airfield at Longer Point. Meanwhile, another eight fighters from the Enterprise maintained a combat air patrol over the transport sports from six until eight o'clock. When they were replaced by others, bombers began to hit Targi and the Lear Point area. But no enemy air activity was seen all morning. The Americans had it all to themselves, and the only planes damaged were those hurt in operational accidents. Planes from the other carriers struck the seaplane base at Gavutu. The surprise was complete. The American planes arrived and began bombing and strafing the seaplanes in the water. They destroyed nine float planes similar to the 014-engine Kawanishi flying boat and eight seaplanes that doubled as search planes and bombers. A few Japanese pilots who tried to take off were shot down before they were airborne. Not a single Japanese plane at Gavutu survived the attack. Other carrier planes hit Japanese troop concentrations on Tulagi, some struck targets on the beaches that the Marines would soon invade before dawn. The Marines on the decks of the transports could see the high mountains of the island. That was their objective. The transport slipped through the narrow neck that runs between Guadcanal and Savu Islands into Siok Channel as dawn rose. The guns of the escorting warships fired and flashes of light illuminated the fleet. There was virtually no answering fire. The bombardment from the cruisers and destroyers accompanying the troop ships started fires along the shore. An oil dump exploded, sending flames leaping into the sky at eight o'clock. After two hours of bombing and shelling of the island, the landing craft began to move toward the north shore east of Longer Point. The Marines were nervous, neither they nor then officers had any practical experience in such a landing for this was the first American amphibious invasion since the Spanish-American War. At nine o'clock troops were landing on Guadalcanal. They met no resistance because the Japanese had fled into the hills. The going was ridiculously easy. The Marines soon saw how completely they had surprised the enemy. They came A.C. Ross, wooden barracks that had never been slept in. They found a tent with a breakfast table full of platters and bowls of meat rice and cooked plums. There were half-filled rice bowls scattered around. Chopsticks hastily dropped on the table or on the straw mats of the floor. The tents themselves told why the Japanese had left so rapidly they were torn by shrapnel and some were knocked flat by the shelling of the naval vessels before the landing. 
but any Marine who felt like celebrating over the ease with which they had taken their early objectives had some shocks coming. It was true that the Japanese had been surprised on Guadcanal, and they had not dug in yet, nor created permanent fortifications, because most of the men were construction troops not fighting men, but over on Targi Lieutenant Colonel Merritt Edson's 1st Marine Raider Battalion, and the 5th Battalion of the 2nd Marines had encountered stout resistance about 250 Japanese were located on this island. The Japanese were troops of the Yokohama Air Base Detachment under Captain Hasik Miyazaki. They were experienced and dedicated. Fighters Edson's first raiders were the toughest American troops in the Pacific. They were all volunteers chosen from the ranks of a force known for its fighting qualities. The raider concept had come from Lieutenant Colonel Evans Carlson's recommendation for creation of a commando force, and Carlson's experience had included a service tour of several months with the Chinese Communist Eighth Route Army in its Gila struggles against the Japanese in North China, Edson's raiders had trained for many months under Spartan conditions, and when they came to Guadcanal they already had a powerful reputation. As it turned out, they would need every trick they had learned, and would learn some new ones. This invasion was the first contact between highly trained American troops and seasoned Japanese veterans since the war had begun in December, the Japanese had a reputation even more fearsome than that of the raider battalions gained through the phenomenally rapid march of their forces through the Philippines, Malaya and the East Indies for months. Tokyo had crowed over its victories, and half the world had come to believe the Japanese were invincible, a reputation the Imperial High Command was pleased to encourage Tulagi. Then was in a sense the first testing ground Edson's troops landed at 8.15am on the northwestern part of the island, and at the beginning the going did not seem much harder than it was on Guadcanal. They encountered some resistance from a few outposts, the northwest part of Targi was covered with thick jungle small trees, vines and bougainvillea with its beautiful leaves and sharp thorns. At first the terrain seemed to be the worst obstacle, Edson lost only one man, and that one to a sniper. As the marines hit the beach, Edson planned to move inland to a ridge that ran the length of the island, and then work along the top of that ridge, clearing the slopes as they moved south. But the terrain was so difficult that it took three hours for the men to chop their way along a mile and a half of rising ground. Having reached the ridge line, the marines moved ahead, came out of the jungle and ran straight into the central Japanese defences built on the hillside, the Japanese had constructed dugouts and rock embrasures, and had placed their machine guns carefully to create interlocking fields of fire. The Japanese defence was based on keeping the enemy below them, but the Marine found that by crawling up the cliffs they could drop charges of dynamite and grenades into the dugouts, and that was the method they had to use to advance once a dugout was blown. It still was not safe in one hole. The Americans killed 17 Japanese with dynamite charges. One Marine spotted a radio inside and went in to retrieve it. There were still two Japanese soldiers alive, and they shot him and another man who came after him before they were killed. One section of Marines took on this defence position in the centre of the island, while the centre and left flank of Edson's force pushed down the ridge. But even along the ridge line, the going was not easy. One company suffered 15% casualties. That first afternoon, the frontal resistance was stiff, but with the Japanese, frontal resistance was only half the battle snipers seemed to be everywhere. Tied in trees in the tops of buildings behind rocks, a favourite tactic of the snipers was to let the forward element of a marine unit pass and then begin shooting at the men from behind. This move almost always meant death for the sniper, but usually not before he had caused several casualties. And one thing the first raiders learned that day was that the small 25 caliber Japanese rifle and machine gun slug were more apt to wound than to kill, which from the Japanese point of view was satisfactory since it took additional troops and resources to care for the wounded. During the afternoon the raiders drove along the ridge and until they ran into a three-sided ravine whose floor was an old British cricket field the Japanese had dug into the ravine walls and established the fields of fire that would become so familiar in later months, as the marines moved up, they ran into crossfire, and Edson stopped because darkness was coming, and this was no time to be probing. You known dangers that night the marines on Tulagi had another new experience, 
the Japanese, knowing they were outnumbered with no chance of survival, staged one of the death-desperate counter-attacks for which they would become infamous. They waited until the marine perimeter was quiet. Then, at 10.30 a.m., they broke through between two companies and surrounded one of them, the marines fought in their foxholes, and in the open using guns, machine guns, grenades. And knives, the Japanese came along the ridge toward Colonel Edson's command post, and reached a point fifty yards from him. Finally, the Marines overpowered the Japanese and threw them back, but not before one company had lost half its non-commissioned officers. The next day, August 8th, more troops were landed on Tulagi until there were 7,500 on that side of Sea Channel Edson's raiders, and men of the 5th Battalion of the 2nd Marines began moving again toward the southeastern end of the island, one by one, they attacked the Dugin machine gun positions on the steep sides of the old cricket ground from one cave. They removed 35 dead Japanese, some of them already rotting and stinking, but some killed in the last moment of defence of the position. From this, the Americans deduced properly that the Japanese tactic was to hold a position until the last. Unless ordered to retreat proof of the discipline of the Japanese armed forces, those troops who surrendered on Guadcanal were mostly members of labour battalions, not combat troops. The raiders that second day encountered dozens of examples of a spirit they had not seen before. In one dugout they cornered three Japanese officers, who at the end had only one loaded pistol among them, as the marines were ready to make the final assault. They heard three shots when they entered the dugout. They discovered three bodies and an empty pistol. One officer had fired all but his last three rounds, then shot his two companions and himself. In those first days, this suicidal attitude surprised the Marines. It was hard for an American to understand how cornered or wounded men with no hope of survival in their hole, knowing that the enemy had an end material and numerical advantage, would almost invariably choose death to surrender. It took some getting used to, but after a few, Japanese had pretended to surrender only to pull out guns or bayonets to attack their captors, or to explode grenades to kill themselves and their enemies. The Marines took the Japanese on their own terms. Thereafter, there was virtually no further attempt to persuade Japanese soldiers to surrender. Tulagi was brought under control on that second day, although not all the Japanese on the island had been killed for days. Afterward, Japanese snipers harassed the American troops until the last sniper was killed. One gets a feel for the stubbornness of the fighting on Tulagi in the experience of gunnery sergeant Angus Goss. He had gone ahead of his men to attack a cave near the cricket field the Japanese had fired sporadically from that position. He moved up close enough to throw hand grenades into the cave, and the Marines had been trained to pull the ring pin of the egg-shaped grenade throw count slowly and hear the explosion. Sergeant Goss pulled the pin through and counted on six. The grenade was lobbed back out of the cave, and he had to duck to escape the blast of his own weapon, after another identical experience. He held the grenade for three seconds, then threw four, five, six, and out it came again. Sergeant Goss called for a satchel charge, a bag filled with dynamite usually used to blow buildings. He thrust in the charge charge, primed it, and ran back a little. The Japanese thrust the charge out of the mouth of the cave, the dynamite exploded and drove a rock splinter into Goss's leg. The wound was not serious enough to F.A. him, but it hurt enough to infuriate him. He picked up his submachine gun and dashed into the cave. Spraying fire, he killed four Japanese soldiers and counted eight others who had died earlier. If possible, the fighting on Gavutu and Tano was worse than that on Tulagi. The landings there came in the middle of the morning. Not many troops were committed because no one expected to find many Japanese there, but since the seaplane base was on these islands the Japanese had fortified them, and the marines ran into trouble. The Japanese were surprised and had still not recovered from the bombardment and aerial attack that had destroyed their seaplanes, so the first troops ashore were met by rifle fire only, but when? The second wave of marines reached the beach the Japanese had organised about 500 yards back, and the fire was intense. The third wave came under fire before the landing craft reached shore, and the casualties were heavy Gavutu and Tan Mogo were both dominated by small hills, not quite 150 feet high, 
but above the sea-level landings this height was enough the Japanese had built their defences along the slopes, and they were well supplied with machine guns, automatic rifles and ammunition. As on Tulagi, each Japanese position had to be taken, they did not retreat. And the viciousness of the fighting on Tanamogo was almost unbelievable. In the early waves the marines had landed tanks, the Japanese had come surging towards the Tanu dock, where the landings had been made, they had jammed crowbars under the treads, thrown grenades, and tried to set the tanks afire with rags soaked in gasoline. One tank commander had opened the hatch and employed the tank's machine gun to kill 23 Japanese soldiers, before one scram bled up the side of the tank and stabbed him to death with a bayonet. Another Japanese then threw gasoline-soaked rags inside the tank, and it burned by mid-afternoon. On this first day, it was apparent that the Marines could use reinforcements, and a unit that had landed earlier on Florida Island, where there were no Japanese, was called over to assist. Tanamogo had been taken, but the Marines were unable to secure the corway that linked the two small islands. The reinforcements were ordered to Tanamogo, and at dusk were given five minutes of preparatory bombardment from naval vessels. Unluckily, one of the last shells hit a fuel dump near the beach, and lit up the shore as if it were noon. As the marines came up, the Japanese had them clearly silhouetted against the sea from the dugouts on the hills, came a steady stream of machine gun and rifle fire. Two boatloads of marines reached the beach, but the coxswain of the third boat was killed at his tiller, and the boat slewed around and headed back out to sea. The following boats did the same, believing there had been some change in orders, so the men of the two boats were stranded ashore, and their only protection was the concrete pier the Japanese were firing as soon as the Americans returned the fire. The Japanese spotted the position by the tracers. Soon several men were down, one boat retired, taking the wounded, and it was some time before the confusion was eliminated, and other boats began to land. Meanwhile the Japanese launched a counter-attack on the beach. Captain Crane, the leader of the unit, was cut off from his boat, and he and five men hid in the brush, and in the darkness they escaped to return to the beach after the Japanese had drawn back to their hillside positions. Eventually they were extricated, but it was four o'clock on the morning of August 8th before another unit landed and was able to secure the causeway. When the fighting started, there were 500 Japanese on the connecting isets of Gutu and Tanamogo. When the fighting ended, there were none. Early on the morning of August 7th, the Tulagi radio station flashed the first word of the United States assault to Rabul. The astounding news reached the Rabau airfield, just as the pilots of the early morning missions were preparing to take off for another day's harassment of the Australians on New Guinea. The orders were immediately cancelled, and all available planes were dispatched to strike the American invasion force before the planes could take off. They received the unwelcome news from Tulagi, the entire flying boat flotilla had been destroyed. Then contact with Tulagi was broken, which could only mean that the base there had been overrun at 8.30am. A flight of 27 twin-engine Betty bombers took off from Rabul. They had been loaded for the strike against Australian forces on New Guinea. So they carried bombs instead of torpedoes. 180 fighters accompanied them as they climbed to 13,000 feet, flew east to Boer Island and turned south of along the Banville coast, they were picked up by four Enterprise planes just after one o'clock in the afternoon. The Enterprise fighters were flying at 18,000 feet, when down below they spotted the large formation of Betty bombers, escorted by the Zeros just above Florida Island. The F-4Fs attacked, and Lieutenant VP DS shot down one bomber, four others began to smoke and were listed as probables but after this initial run, the Zeros joined the fight, and the F-4Fs broke off to take refuge in cloud cover, as they had been instructed to do. They had been hard hit, one of the F-4Fs had been shot down, and Lieutenant D's plane was so badly shot up he had to make an emergency landing on the WASP Lieutenant GE Firebar LED, another flight of six fighters from the Enterprise, and they found the enemy off Santa Isabel Island. The Zeros came in fast ten of them, and attacked three of the fighters. All three F-4Fs were shot down. The other three American fighters attacked the bombers, and Enan RN dis shot down one Betty. The first kill of a Zero was made by radio electrician TBUW Rhodes, but the Zeros came after them in force, 
and the F4Fs ducked into clouds to hide. There were ten zeros after them in two formations, and they came in observing the Japanese rule, never let your wingman out of sight. They attacked the F4Fs from the starboard quarter, and Lieutenant Firebar and enlisted pilot W.S. Stevenson Jr. and pilot machinist W.H. Warden were shot down. One of the coast watchers picked up Firebar from the water off Santa Isabel Island, a Guadcanal coast watcher sent a canoe to rescue Warden off that same island, but Stevenson was not found aboard the other carriers. The story was much the same. The bombers were much easier targets. Six fighters of Flight 323 ran into enemy bombers off Longer Point and shot down four of them. Machinist de Runon destroyed two single-handedly just after 2.30 a.m. in the afternoon, when the Japanese Betty bombers and Zero fighters began their run over the islands, coast watchers were on the alert. Paul Edward Mason, a copra planter in peacetime, was stationed on Malab Hill on Banville overlooking Buin at nine o'clock in the morning. He sent a message that 24 Japanese bombers were heading toward Guadcanal. They were still 400 M or two and a four hours away from the target when that message was broadcast back from Pearl Harbor to the fleet. That message reached the invasion fleet in plenty of time for preparations. The reaction of HMS Canberra, one of the Australian cruisers, was typical when the word came the boatswain's mate piped the message, the ship will be attacked at noon by 24 torpedo bombers. All hands will pipe to dinner at 11 o'clock, and the torpedo bombers came in right on schedule. The United States fighters climbed above them to 20,000 feet as the bombers reached the north shore of Guadcanal, and looked down on the invasion fleet. At noon, the American carrier fighters and the guns of the ships were ready for them. For the first time in the South Pacific, the Japanese were feeling the results of counterattack. The American fighter planes were quite effective against the twin-engine bombers of the 24 Bettys that finally arrived over Guadcanal. All but one was shot down, and the only damage sustained in that first attack was to the destroyer Mug Buford, which was hit by a bomb against the Zero fighters. However, it was a different story. Pilot officer Saro Sakai Japan's leading ace was among those 18 chosen for their skill to make this first long-range mission. Over the target, the Japanese force was jumped by F-4F Wildcats from the carriers, and they went in straight for the bombers, ignoring the Zeros. The Zeros protected the bombers as well as they could, but then turned to the American fighters. Sakai was puzzled by the American tactics the Navy pilots dived against the Zeros, but if they missed on the first pass, they scattered and evaded. They had been instructed well by their intelligence officers, who knew that the Zero was superior in turning and climbing ability, as well as faster. After a grim and skilful battle, Sakai shot down one F-4F and an SBD dive bomber that by itself jumped four Zeros. Several other Japanese pilots made kills, while one zero was lost, Pilot Sakai attacked a group of the scissors movement constantly turning toward each other. Thus the pair of F-4Fs could concentrate their superior firepower on the enemy, while they knew their own planes could absorb an enormous amount of punishment on the ground. The Marines fought fierce Japanese opposition on Tulagi Gavutu and Tanamogo on Tulagi. They suffered 90 casualties, but took control of the island. By the end of the second day, the Japanese garrison of 250 men fought to the end. 200 men were killed, three surrendered, and the rest swam the strait to Florida Island to continue fighting on Gavutu. And Tanambu, the Marines suffered 250 casualties. The 500-man Japanese garrison was wiped out to the last man. The fierceness of this fighting on Tulagi was in sharp contrast with the easy advance of the Marines on Guadcanal. There on the morning of August 8th, the Marines reached the edge of the airport they would name Henderson Field after a flyer killed at Midway. They were beginning to develop a contempt for the enemy. I wish those Japanese would come out and fight one, Marine said, within the hearing of Richard Tracis, the international news service correspondent who had accompanied the invasion. All they do is run into the jungle on the surface. Then the Marines couldn't ask for a finer war, but the officers were edgy that second afternoon. It was too easy at sea. The Americans apparently had no opposition. Either a few Japanese patrol craft and tenders and one or two transports had been caught off the shore, 
and they had been destroyed in the first hours of the invasion by shelling and bombing, only in the air were the Japanese giving the Americans pause. Most of those first W. West of bombers were destroyed, but the cost of meeting the Zeros was 21 of Admiral Fletcher's 99 carrier planes, that lost not high by operational standards, convinced Fletcher that his decision to withdraw was sound. At six o'clock that evening, Fletcher asked Admiral Gormley to allow him to withdraw his carriers. He withdrew before he had a reply. When Admiral Turner intercepted Fletcher's dispatch, he realised that the carrier withdrawal would leave him without any air cover, though the number of Japanese planes could be expected to increase sharply as the enemy brought down more aircraft through the island chain. As Fletcher began to withdraw, the Japanese were moving in force when the word invasion had been flashed from Guadalcanal to Rabul Vice Admiral Gichi Maawa had reacted immediately. Admiral Maawa was commander of the Japanese Eighth Fleet and the Outer South Seas Force, which meant he had the responsibility for the whole South Pacific operation. His first move was to load six small transports with troops and dispatch them with destroyer escort to reinforce the 2,000-man Guad Canal garrison. But the convoy ran into the American submarine S-38, which was operating out of Australia following the fall of the Philippines, the S-38 sank the transport Mayo Maru with 342 men aboard the sinking, coupled with the reports of the enormous American invasion flotilla persuaded the Admiral that it was too dangerous at the moment to try to reinforce the garrison, and he called back the other five transports. By that time, Japanese naval assistance was already on the way to Guad Canal. Admiral Mawa had been lucky in the matter of timing early on the morning of August 7th, as the Tulagi garrison sent its last message, five heavy cruisers left, cavern on the northern tip of New Ireland. Three of them were headed northeast for Manus Island in the Admiralty Group, and two were bound for Rabul. Admiral Mawa soon ordered all five cruisers to hasten to Rabul shortly after noon. The cruiser Choai, accompanied by a destroyer, moved into Simpson Harbour. The other four cruisers waited in St George's Channel between New Ireland and New Britain for the Choai to rejoin. When she came up late that afternoon, she was carrying Admiral Mawa himself and was accompanied by the light cruisers Tenryu and Yubari, so the Japanese moved toward Guadalcanal with five heavy cruisers, two light cruisers and a destroyer as they sped South Admiral Mawa composed his battle plan. By cutting speed, they could delay their arrival until after midnight on August 8th and make a surprise night attack on the American forces at the beachhead. The Admiral knew that the Americans had several carriers in that area while he had none a night attack was a guarantee that he would not be harassed by American planes since the Americans had no record of proficiency in night aerial operations. In fact, the Americans had no record of competence in any sort of night naval operations, while this aspect of tactics had become a Japanese specialty Mars problem that afternoon, was how to move close to Guad Canal without coming in too soon, and still not give away the element of surprise he had to attack to support the Guad Canal defenders. But if he could surprise the enemy, the effectiveness would be enormous. The Admiral did not know it just then, but the nature of the divided command, the inferiority of the American air intelligence system, and the lack of clearly defined search methods would all play directly into his hands for intelligence about Japanese ship movements the Americans at Guadalcanal had to depend on air search and submarine reports only under the most special circumstances. Would the reports of coast watchers be of much use concerning naval ship operations? Early in the day, the cruisers were sighted by United States B-17 Army bombers as they moved down toward Rabau on the evening of August 7th. The Mawa force was sighted by the S-38 just as it came out of St. George's Channel that night. The commander of the S-38 reported the contact to Brisbane. But those two reports were not given much credence by American naval commanders, because Rabul had become the Japanese Navy's forward base, and it was quite normal for ships to move in and out. The Americans saw no indication that the ships in question were steaming toward Guadcanal. Admiral Gawley was responsible for the coordination of all elements of the American attack. But to secure air searches, he had to depend on several sources first, were the long-range B-17 bombers of General MacArthur's American Army Air Force and the Australian Army Air Force part of MacArthur's command, which operated independently second, 
was Admiral McCain's land-based Naval Air Force, which included a number of SE plane tenders and PBI patrol bombers. General MacArthur's planes were to take responsibility for the search of the Bismarck Islands, concentrating on the big naval and air base at Rabal McCain, was to watch the northern approaches to the region, which meant True and the Marshal's Admiral Fletcher's carrier planes were supposed to make short-range searches, but actually made none at all. Fletcher was bemused with his worries Admiral Turner had looked at his charts and seen that the Japanese had a marvellous approach to the island of Guadalcanal along the west coast of Banville, straight down between Chazel Island and Vilayela, past Columbangara, between New Georgia and Santa Isabel, and then between Florida Island and Guadcanal's north coast, the lane was christened the slot. Soon it was to become infamous in American naval history. On the morning of August 8th, four PB were scheduled to fly from Nandi on a 700M long triangular pattern, whose apex was the Fiji Islands. They would come up almost due west of Santa Cruz. Island 6 PB would fly search patterns from Espiritu Santo northeast over the Santa Cruz Islands and end at a point slightly above the Bismarcks, but far to the west of the Japanese task force. 6PB would spread out from M across the slot from Guadcanal to search an area north and west of the slot. 3B7S were to search north of Guadcanal on the night of August 7th, when Admiral Turner studied the search plan for the following day. He found the slot was completely uncovered. He asked Admiral McCain for a special search there the next day, but somehow between Admiral Turner's flagship, Admiral McCain's headquarters, and the SE plane tender Mackinac at M, the message was lost. The search was never made, thus on August 8th the Americans had left uncovered the most obvious approach the of Japanese any enemy naval was sighted by the S-38 coming out of St George's Channel. The submarine was nearly 600 mil from Guadcanal. The fact that the cruisers were travelling fast was indicative of trouble, but the report was marred by the S-38 identification of a cruiser as a destroyer, thus downgrading the force at about 10.30am on the morning of August 8th an Australian Hudson bomber from New Guinea cited the Japanese force the pilots had been working under orders for radio silence, but in the invasion they were told to break silence if something urgent seemed to be in the offing. The pilot of this search plane did not radio, he noted the ships and their direction, and then proceeded with his search mission, which took most of the afternoon he returned to his base at Mill Bay, had tea, and then went into the intelligence office to report the contact. It was about six o'clock in the evening before the report of ships travelling down the slot was dispatched. The Australians reported to General MacArthur's headquarters, which reported to Pearl Harbour, which broadcast to the fleet. And that is how Admiral Turner got the word, but the report was fatally defective. The Hudson pilot identified the ships as three cruisers, two destroyers and two seaplane tenders. When Admiral Turner read that message, he inferred that the enemy was moving to set up a SE plane base. The most likely spot was a Protect Ed Harbour at Ricarta Bay, about 175 miles from the landing beaches of Guadalcanal. So while the message indicated a Japanese response, it did not show the Americans what Admiral Marwa had on his mind. Another Australian pilot who correctly identified the Japanese force about half an hour after the first pilot also delayed passing on the information, and his report did not arrive for many hours, as darkness began to lower over Seok Channel Rear Admiral Vac Crutchley RN, Australian commander of the screen around the amphibious force, sent his cruisers and destroyers to their night dispositions. He and Turner had divided the landing area into three defensive sectors in the south, were the cruisers Australia Canra and Chicago, and the destroyers Pateran and Bagley Carly took personal command of this group, which was to patrol south and west of S Island to prevent any enemy ships from coming through between the island and Cape Esperance on the northwest end of Guadcanal. The northern sector ran from Savo Island to Florida Island, northeast of Guadcanal. This area was to be patrolled by the cruisers Vincent Osoria and Quincy, and the destroyers Helm and Wilson. The officer in command of these ships was Captain Frederick L. Reef Co. of the Vinson, the destroyer ERS Blue and Ralph Talbot were given a special mission west of Savo Island to cover the large sea area west of the channel.
Because they carried modern radar, the eastern sector ran from Lunga Point, where the Marines had established the first beachhead, to the approaches to Lango and Sear channels here. Rear Admiral Norman Scott was in command of the light cruisers Sanjan and Hobart Australian, and the destroyers Monson and Buchanan. Admiral Turner in the transport Macaulay had personal command of the 19 transports and freighters. He planned to conduct unloading operations all night long, because Fletcher's abandonment persuaded him it was imperative to move the transports away from the beaches at dawn at 8.30am on the night of August 8th. Turner called an urgent conference aboard his flagship. He had just learned that virtually no cargo had been unloaded from the transports at Tulagi, and he had to give General Van der Gree and Admiral Crutchley the bad news. Van der Gree had to be told that whatever supplies they did not get that night would be delayed because the transports had to be taken away from the beach for protection. Crutchley had to be told that the surface forces would have no air protection for the next day or two, and Turner had to tell both commanders that he expected the Japanese to send bombers the next day from that sea. Plain base, they could also expect air attack from Rabul and Caven, and it was nearly midnight night before the three commanders assembled in Turner's cabin aboard the Macaulay. They talked about the reports of the sighted Japanese vessels, and Turner said he was sure the force would head for Rickart Bay. The next morning, he said Admiral McCain's land-based aircraft would bomb Rata Bay. The three commanders did discuss the possibility of a night attack by Japanese surface forces, but Admiral Turner was not seriously worried in the first place, as far as he knew. The air search that day had covered every area in the second place, with the radar destroyers out front, and with the disposition of the cruisers, he was confident that the protective forces could meet any challenge at midnight. Admiral Crutchley and General Vandergrift left the flagship. The weather was cloudy, and rain hid the western horizon. It was too late for Crutchley to take the Australia south to his patrol area, so he ordered the captain to steam just west of the Guadcanal transports. The clock said it was August 9th, all was quiet, and Rear Admiral Mawa and his staff had left Rabul so rapidly that there had been no time to agree on a plan of attack against the invaders. Mawa did not know the size or composition of the American force, and all these matters had to be ascertained early on the morning of August 8th. Mawa sent out float planes from each of his five heavy cruisers to conduct an air search. They were much more skillful and successful than, and the Americans, and two of them got a good look at the American invasion fleet between Tulagi and Guadalcanal. They came back to report having sighted a battleship, six cruisers, 19 destroyers and 18 transports. The Japanese error was in slightly overestimating the strength by calling one cruiser a battleship, but that minor mistake did not have any effect on the planning or the outcome of Maie's operations. Admiral Ma's plan for action had been approved, moved by the 8th Fleet and sent by radio to Tokyo. At first, the naval general staff considered the plans reckless, but after a few hours of discussion, it was approved, and no attempt was made to stop Mawa. The planes reported sighting many American warships and transports around Guadcanal, when Admiral Mawa sent his search planes out 250 mees. He kept his force in the area north of Schwas Bay, between Banville and Schwas Island. It was in this area that the first Australian Hudson search plane found the Japanese force to keep the plane away. Mawa ships put up an anti-aircraft barrage, and that was probably the reason for the pilot's faulty identification of two seaplane tenders, which lulled Admiral Turner into a false sense of security. That day, early in the afternoon, the Japanese cruisers recovered their float planes, and the striking force began to steam south through Schwaz Bay at 4.20am in the afternoon. The ships were in the middle of the slot, and there they turned to parallel Schwaz Island and pass Vellulshle and Kolom Bangara, since those two sightings by the Australian planes the Japanese forces had remained undetected as they came straight down. The only ship they saw was the Japanese seaplane tender Akitsushima, en route to do what Admiral Turner expected establish a seaplane base, but on New Georgia, not Santa Isabel Island. Admiral Mawa had no time to dispatch couriers with formal battle plans to his captains. The flagship signal blinkers began to work at dusk, sending the battle orders. All ships were to go in with guns and torpedoes to attack the ships at the Guadcanal anchorage, 
they would dash in at high speed and dash out across Sea Channel to Targi, strike the transports there, retire north of Savo Island, and steam back up the slot as one last last check on the plans Admiral Marwa sent out two search planes from the cruisers, and they returned to report that all was as it had been in the morning, the Admiral called on one of his staff officers to compose an appropriate message. To the fleet in the spirit of the samurai, let us strike in certain victory in the traditional night attack of the Imperial Navy. Let each man do his best, the message was sent to every ship, and so the men of seven Japanese cruisers and one destroyer made their final preparations for battle. Shortly after eleven o'clock, Admiral Mawa ordered two more seaplane scouts launched from the cruisers they were to fly above the American ship's report on their night disposition and remain over Guadalcanal to light up the sky at the proper time, with flares, as the planes came in through the intermittent rain soles, the burning hulk of the transport George F. Elliot was as good as a beacon. One of the Japanese scout planes was C by the United States destroyer Ralph Talbot, the northern radar picket boat. The Ralph Talbot's radio operator broke silence to give the alarm that a plane had been seen over Savo Island heading east, which would bring it across the path of the American fleet. The warning was heard by the destroyer Blue and a few other ships, but for some reason it failed to reach Admiral Turner. Other ship commanders, hearing or seeing a plane, assumed that if it was unfriendly, Admiral Turner would have sent out a general alarm on Guadcanal. A little before one o'clock, one plane woke up a tent full of marines. It did not sound like an American aircraft. The engine had a high-pitched tone that was unfamiliar, and it kept circling around the island, which seemed unusual. Suddenly the marines knew the plane was Japanese, because it began dropping flares in several sectors of the sky over Guad Canal and Siok Channel, and they glowed with a greenish-white light for an hour and a half. These float planes circled, broadcasting to Admiral Mawa, the dispositions of the transports and the steaming patterns of the cruisers and destroyers. The transports were the major target of Admiral Ma's planned attack. Before midnight, he ordered his force to assume a long battle column with his flagship the Chokai at the head, followed by the heavy cruisers Ayoba Kako Kinugasa and Futak, behind came the light. Cruisers Tenryu and Yubari and the destroyer Yunagi at 12.30pm. Admiral Mawa issued his battle warning, and 15 minutes later the force was called to combat stations just before one o'clock in the morning. The Choai crossed the track of the American destroyer Blue. The squadron trained its guns on the United States destroyer but the lookouts aboard Blue saw nothing in the MC, and the destroyer steamed away to the southwest as the Japanese ship ships passed by. Admiral Mawa was nervous, believing the Blue had reported his coming, and he changed course and then changed again, when his lookouts reported another destroyer at one o'clock in the morning, the chalky rounded Savo Island, and just after 1.30am, the lookouts saw the lines of an American destroyer two miles north. This ship was the Jarvis the destroyer damaged in the Japanese air attacks. That day her captain was taking the ship to Sydney for dry-do repairs. If the men of the Jarvis saw Japanese, they had no way of alarming the American fleet, because the destroyer communication system was dead. The orders given by Admiral Mawa before the battle had specified that ships should be prepared to fire torpedoes, and the cruisers fired several torpedoes at the Jarvis but all missed the Japanese ships did not open fire with their guns, because this was the prerogative of the flagship. Thus the Jarvis escaped, and the Japanese went on toward the American fleet, still unheralded. The Japanese continued to come at 26 knots, and the lookout spotted two American destroyers, and then two United States cruisers seven mil away. Still the Americans were asleep. Admiral Mawa ordered the ships to begin firing torpedoes independently, as they found targets. The first targets were the cruisers Chicago and Canra, and the destroyer Bagley. It was fully five minutes after the first torpedoes were launched, before the destroyer USS Patterson finally saw a ship of strange configuration. Heard gunfire on Tulagi Island, and noted correctly that the Marines were having their troubles over there. Topper noticed a slight tremor of the ship's hull at 1.45am, which he identified as depth charges exploding that was to be expected. Admiral Turner's messages had repeatedly warned of the danger of submarine attack, 
The tremor was actually caused by the explosion of the spent torpedoes the Choi had fired at the Chicago Ego Topper had little time to worry about this oddity, however, because as he was speaking to the damage control watch over the intercommunication system, a lookout reported a plane overhead and then a flare lit up the sky on the ship's port quarter. Soon it was not one star shell, but an entire string of them. The gunnery officer Lieutenant Commander W. Trussell was the first man aboard the Asoria to sense the danger. He told the bridge to order general quarters, and as he did so the ship was lighted by searchlights, and in a few seconds the first salvo of Japanese shells bracketed the Atoria. Trell ordered his guns to begin firing, and the first Asoria salvo went out. As it was fired, the captain came stumbling sleepily up to the bridge and demanded that the ship cease firing. He feared they were shooting at their own ships. Perhaps the junior officers had acted hastily. This stoppage threw the ship into confusion. A minute passed, and Trell pleaded to the talker, Tell the captain, Sir, for God's sake, give the word, commence firing. The captain realised there might be a battle on, and gave the order but the debate had given the choky gunners time to get the range, and as Captain Greenman gave the order, an eight-in shell ripped into the Atoria starting fires. Aid ships by the light of these flames, the Chokai poured shells into the American cruiser, and the Asoria was firing ing, but not accurately. She fired eleven salvos, but managed to hit the choky only once, a shell that smashed into the Admiral's chart room, but did not slow down the Japanese flagship. The Atoria was rapidly becoming a hulk. Both forward eight in gun turrets were destroyed. The float plane off Aid ships caught fire and burned, and the five in guns were wrecked. A shell hit the bridge and killed the quartermaster at the wheel, and several others. The fires created such terrific heat in the engine rooms that the black gang had to abandon their stations from stem to stern. The ship seemed to be ablaze, and after fifteen minutes only, number two turret was still operating. Lieutenant Commander W. B. Davidson aimed its guns at a searchlight and fired the ship's last salvo a shell, hit the Choi S forward turret, but the big Japanese warship swept past Strike 3 Allied cruisers when the American cruiser column next ship in line, the Quincy, was the new target of the Japanese, as the Choi devoted her attention to the destruction of the Atoria, the Ioba began firing on the Quincy, like the Canra, the Chicago and the Atoria. The Quincy was unprepared for action as the Ioba came up. She opened her searchlights on the Quincy, and in the bright light the Japanese on the bridge could see with wonder that the American ship's guns were still trained for, and after it was like shooting ducks in Tokyo Bay, Captain S. N. Moore had refused to listen to junior officer assertions that the aircraft overhead for the past hour were enemy. When the searchlights came on, he ordered the guns to fire on them, then had second thoughts. What if they were friendly ships and ordered his recognition lights turned on? Then he turned to starboard precisely the wrong way with an enemy shooting at him from the port quarter, and the Quincy could not fire her forward gun, that was the last error, and the Japanese shells began to hit. One struck the seaplane in its catapult and sent up a glow of flame that was as good as a beacon. The Quincy then came under fire from the Furutaka cruiser column and after the Asoria began to sink, the Chalky also turned its attention to the Quincy station. After station was wiped out by shells, the bridge went, and... The captain was mortally wounded. The engine rooms were sealed off off by flame, with no chance for the black gang to escape. The turrets were hit, and the small guns destroyed, and the sick bay disappeared in a shell blast. The ship was abandoned just after 2.30 a.m. in the morning, and she sank almost immediately strike four Allied cruisers at least aboard the Vincennes. The Americans were alert at 11.45 a.m. The officers on the bridge had heard the warning from the destroyer Ralph Talbot that an enemy plane had had been sighted, and Captain Reef had instructed them then to exercise extreme vigilance. The warning from the Patterson that the wolves were in the fold did not reach them, but when the Japanese flares went up, Captain Reef, Co. lost no time in getting to the bridge, and no time in worrying whether or not this was the enemy, General Quarters was sounding, and he did not question it. As he was going to the bridge, he felt two underwater explosions, torpedoes going off nearby, and saw gun flashes and heard gunfire, 
but even then Captain Reef Co and his officers believed they were under air attack only, and at 1.50 a.m. Captain Reef saw the searchlights reaching for the American cruises. He assumed they were American searchlights, and asked by voice radio that they be shut off, but his gunnery officer Lieutenant Commander R. L. Adams trained his guns on the nearest searchlight. A salvo fell and splashed a quarter of a mile short of the Vinson, and she fired back, and on her second salvo hit the Kinugasa, but almost at that moment enemy shells began landing on the Vinson. At least three of the Japanese cruisers were attacking her. The port side of the Vincent's bridge was destroyed by a shell. A dozen shells knocked out most of the small guns. Captain Reef turned hard right and ran into three torpedoes from the Choai. The fire rooms and the engine rooms were filled with smoke and steam began to plume up from ruptured pipes and valves. A torpedo struck the number one Fireo and killed every man. Communications went out as the power failed. The captain, seeing two searchlights on the starboard side, mistakenly assumed they were friendly and ran up the American colours, the Japanese cruisers mistaking the flag for that of a United States admiral, redoubled their shelling by 2.10am. The Venn's guns were all silent. None remained that could be fired. The Vincennes was listing to port, and Captain Reef Co. was wondering if the moment had come when he should give the order to abandon ship when the Japanese suddenly ceased firing and moved off. But the Vincent was finished, she lingered a while, dead in the water. Most of the living got off and began to swim paddle or float, clinging to jetsam. Then the Vincent sank, strike five. Allied cruisers, when the destroyers of the American Northern Group milled about, not able to ascertain the pattern of movements of the American cruisers, and therefore unable to help much, the Wilson saw the flares and was alerted, and then watched the Japanese column illuminate and attack the American cruisers. She opened fire, shooting at the searchlight five miles away. The shells did not hit anything. The Japanese threw a few shells at the Wilson, but were too busy with the destruction of the cruisers to pay much attention to her. She nearly was wrecked in a collision with the destroyer Helm, which suddenly appeared out of the darkness. The captain of the Wilson rang up full speed, turned hard left and barely passed clear. The Helm's captain did not realise an action was in progress until he saw the American cruisers illuminated by the Japanese searchlights and burning at two o'clock, the helm went rushing off in pursuit of a ship and discovered it was the United States destroyer Bagley. The Japanese were crowing over their victory, and they grew careless. The chalky turned, but the others did not follow, and Admiral Mawa had to run after them like a small boy chasing his peers. Just then, the burning Quincy, very near the point of sinking, hit the flagship with two shells. One wiped out the chart room, and the other smashed the deck near the aviation crane. A third shell only bounced off the forward turret, but still gave the Admiral something to whir about. Mawa did not like taking punishment, so he ordered his captains to withdraw, and the chalky column formed up and again and sped off at thirty-five knots. The Furutaka column headed homeward and crossed the path of the destroyer Ralph Talbot when the Japanese came down around Savo Island. The Ralph Talbot was on the other side of the sound, near Florida Island, and thus missed out on the original action. Her bridge watch heard the Patterson's first warning call, unlike the other ships, and she went steaming southwest at twenty-five knots to try to catch the invaders. The captain and crew could see the flashing lights of battle, but they did not know what was happening until on the way out the retiring Tenu put a searchlight on the Ralph Talbot and began firing at her. Soon the Furutaka Yubari and Tenryu were all firing at the destroyer, but she made an elusive target, and in several salvos the Japanese ships hit her only once, knocking out some of the torpedo tubes. The Ralph Talbot's Captain Lieutenant Commander J. W. Callahan made a mistake that was very common that night. He assumed that the ships were American, called them up on voice radio, and turned on his recognition lights. But the call was answered by the Japanese cruiser Yubari, which turned its searchlight on the Ralph Talbot's bridge and began firing more rapidly. On the third side, Alvo, the Yubari got the ship's range, and the shells began to cause damage. The chart room gun control system, the wardro and a five-in gun were all destroyed or partly destroyed. The Ralph Talbot launched four torpedoes that did no damage, and then ducked into a rain squall the ship was burning, and listed twenty degrees to starboard. And by this time, Admiral Mars' column had reached a point north of Savo Island, 
Until now, the Admiral could be forgiven, given for not accomplishing his primary mission, which was to destroy the transports off the beaches. He had to understate the case being a busy man, but he was heading away from the transports, and the decision had to be made should he move back in and destroy them, or should he go home to report a phenomenal naval victory. His staff estimated that they had sunk seven cruisers and five destroyers, and he decided to retire, and the United States transports were saved off Guadcanal. The Allied Defence Force was in shambles, and the American and Australian navies had lost more than 1,000 men killed and 700 wounded. The Canra was dead in the water, her crew fought fires that blazed fiercely in spite of a heavy rain, ammunition was exploding AF, which kept the destroyer patron which had rushed to her aid from coming in to assist her. After an hour, the patron managed to get alongside and pass over hoses and pump for the survivors, but it was too late. Admiral Turner ordered the ship either to join up with the transports or be destroyed. He was already planning to move out before the expected air and sea attacks of the daylight hours began since the Kerr could not move. She had to be destroyed, and the destroyer Ellert torpedoed her. The crew of the Canra was rescued by the destroyers Pateron and Blue. The Pateron then went, went off, and was nearly sunk by the Chicago, whose nervous captain at this point opened fire on anything that moved but the destroyer and the battered cruiser, managed to identify one another before the matter became serious. Luckily their gunnery was not accurate, so neither was hurt by the other. Before daybreak the Quincy and the Vinson sank. The Asoria lingered on until noon of August 9th, and then, despite heroic measures to save her by fighting fires and in holes, a magazine exploded, and she sank the Ralph Talbot, although sorely damaged, managed to limp into Tulagi. The Japanese retired from the scene at high speed, because Admiral Mawa was certain that as dawn came so with the carrier planes searching for. Him, but he did not reckon with the timidity of the American air commanders. Admiral Fletcher had retired before getting permission from Admiral Gormley, but twelve hours later, when he still did not have permission to quit, he apparently decided there were worse dangers than the enemy, and he headed back toward Guadcanal at 3 a.m. He received a report of surface activity in the Guadcanal area, but he was too far away to do anything about it, even if he had wished.